you've been given a handout, and uh, uh, we are going to be talking about discipleship. Now, folks, you need to understand that if there were Christian bookstores still around, you could go to these Christian bookstores and the shelves would be full of books on discipleship. And I'm sure they would be good. I'm not saying that they would not. But I think that we really, if you want to know about discipleship, then you need to look at the book about discipleship. And John 13 through 17, Jesus is going to talk about discipleship. And so I call it discipleship at the master's level. That's kind of like a play on words just a little bit because we know, educationally speaking, that you, uh, you go to grammar school and you go to uh, junior high and you go to high school and you get your bachelor's degree and uh, your four-year bachelor's degree. And then you go higher, you go get your master's degree if you're so inclined. So the idea is that this is about discipleship at the master's level. But also it is, it is a play on words because Jesus was the master. Pastor talked about him going into those synagogues and teaching them and, and, and telling them the things that they needed to understand. And, and so anytime that Jesus would teach, he was teaching at the master's level. And so in 13 through 17, Jesus is going to teach about discipleship at the master's level. Now this is supposed to be a teaching. I don't know what it's going to turn into because I'm telling you, I'm up here behind the pulpit on a stage just like, just like normal, you know. So, so I'm going to do my best to keep it as much as I can about teaching. But if I get a little bit excited, would you please forgive me and please bear with me? Uh, because like I said, it's been a long time since I have been in a, a pulpit setting just like this. If you will look at your handout, please. I want to talk about... In order to understand John 13 through 17, uh, the, the structure of that, I, I think we need to look at the context of John 13 through 17. And let, let, me just, let me just reiterate this again. I believe that all of us want to be disciples. I believe that all of us are in that process. And I'm going to do my best over the next few weeks to show you that. We are in the process of discipleship, okay? But again, let me emphasize this. If you want to know, if you truly, not because I'm, I'm teaching this. No, 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 no. That's, that's not the deal right here. If you want to truly know about discipleship, I think that we need to look at these five chapters in the Bible, context of 13 through 17, in 13 through 17, you need to know that it is for the 12 disciples. You see, in, in, uh, in uh, chapters 1 through 12, and I'm telling you, Pastor really done me right because he gave me a board, and I know this is written uh, on, your, on your paper right there, but I, I like to write on the board when I teach. You need to understand that in chapters 1 through 12, it is about the people, primarily. Now, the disciples are, I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, anyway, it is about the people for the most part. Jesus is very public in regard to his ministry. It, it's, it's about salvation for the people. It's about giving life to the people. That's in chapters 1 through 12. It's about them believing in him. In chapters 1 through 12, Jesus is letting them know who he is and what he came to do. If you look in chapter 1, the Bible plainly says, he came unto his own. In other words, he came unto the people. And, uh, and in coming to the people right there, he, he says as many of the people that would believe in him, they would become the sons of God. So Jesus Christ came to the people in chapter 1. 
so that they could believe in him. And Jesus Christ came to do certain miracles so that they could believe in him and he, they would become the sons of God and have a life through his name. In chapter 2, let me do a quick uh, scenario of, of these first 12 chapters in John to just kind of show you the picture right here. In chapter 2, Jesus is the, as some people say, he was the life of the party as they have run out of wine and Jesus will take water, you know the story, and he will turn it into wine. And a lot of people get excited about it. They say, oh, Jesus turned water into wine. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. The, the, the wine that Jesus gave to them was superior to any type of wine that they'd ever had in their entire lives. And they understood that and they recognized that. The point being is that the, that the wine that Jesus gives, the life and the joy and the peace and the happiness that Jesus gives is superior to any other thing that you can find in this, in this world. And so Jesus Christ, he, he, has, he, has had a, he has had a party and he's the life of the party. Chapter 3, he gives salvation to a religious leader. And the religious leaders start out this way. We know that you are a teacher come from God. So again, it's, a, it's about the people, but it's just about salvation. Chapter 4, there is the salvation to the Samaritan woman. And as a result of her salvation, she brings all of the men who evidently she knew a lot of them personally out to see Jesus. And they accepted Jesus' teaching for themselves again it is about the people. In fact, in that chapter, Jesus will say, the fields are white in the harvest. The people are out there, and, 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 and it's white in the harvest. Chapter 5, it is the healing of the man who was sick for 38 years. The thing about that is he is among a multitude of impotent folk, and Jesus will heal him right there. And the strange thing is when Jesus heals him, nobody makes a move. They're still waiting on the angel to come down and trouble the water. How strange that is. But that's the way that it was. Again, chapters 1 through 12, it is about the people. In, in, in chapter 6, Jesus will take five loaves and two fishes, and he will feed a multitude of people. In chapter 7, Jesus, at the great day of the feast, will stand up in the midst of all of the people, and he will say, I, I, if you drink of the water of this world, you'll thirst again, but I have water to give unto you. That's what he said to the woman. But he goes on to say in chapter 7, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him, whatever people should receive, praise God, so so it's, so it's about the people. In chapter 8, it's about the salvation of a woman taken in the act of adultery. And Jesus will forgive her right in the midst of the people. In chapter 9, it's about a man who was born blind. And the people know him. And when he's healed, the people see something's happened to him that, that has changed him. We, we knew him as a blind man. We don't know this man who has been changed by the power of God. In chapter 10, Jesus will say to the people, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But he said, but I have come that they, they, whoever they is, whatever group of people, that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. Aren't you glad that you understand, praise God, of the life that Jesus Christ gives unto us? This is what he's doing right here. Chapter 11. He raises Lazarus from the dead. Again, there's a great crowd of people that has gathered around him. And in chapter 12, he goes to crowded Jerusalem. And almost like this is one more time that Jesus will, will try to get the people to understand who he is and what he came to do and what he wants to do for them, praise God. So, so, so it, it's, it's really about the people. It's about their salvation. It's about their life. That's the reason that Jesus came. But we also must understand that not only did Jesus Christ come to save people, but Jesus Christ came to disciple us. Once we're saved, once we're born again, once we're part of the family of God, now this other process begins to kick in. And Jesus wants to disciple us. And so in, 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 uh, in chapter 13 through 17, it's no longer the people. They're not there. It is only Jesus and his 12 disciples. 
And for five chapters, he will teach them about discipleship. We can go on and we can note there that, that uh, you know, 18 through 21, uh, there is the, uh, there is the uh, uh, public, public, public trial and, and there is, the, of course, the, the crucifixion. But praise God, there is also the resurrection. Aren't you glad for that right there? So, so uh, but in 13, there we go, <laughs> 13 through 17, it's private. It's just them. And Jesus begins to teach them. Now, 13 through 17 describes the process of discipleship. And I really appreciate our pastor. He was speaking so much the things that I wanted to speak about uh, uh, tonight, today. He talked about what I call there is the divine initiative. In other words, God does his part. You might as well understand it. You might as well write it down in your little black book, green book, white book, gray book, whatever type of polka dotted book, whatever type of book you got. That when you become a Christian, God is going to do his part to disciple you. He is, going to, he, he is going to do things. He's going to allow things. And we're going to, we'll be looking at that in, in, in 13 through 17 right here. God is going to do his part. He knows what he wants. He knows where you can be. He knows where you can get to. And so, so, so he is going to do his part to make sure that he disciples you and turns you into the, the servant, the minister, the disciple that he wants you to be. And, and again, he knows what to do. He knows how to do it. Yes. But there's also the human cooperation. God will do his part. Amen. Yes. But you have to cooperate with that. And that's where we run into the problem. It is when God is doing some of those things that we, uh, I don't know about this. You know, I didn't really sign up for this. This is where, as the old saying goes, you separate the men from the boys. This is where the rubber meets the road. And if, ever, and if it was easy, Everybody could do it. I am convinced. I do not have any statistics to back this up, and we have dealt with statistics a lot over the last few weeks. I do not have any statistics to back this up that this comes by observation simply alone. And my observation is this. This is where people drop out. Praise God we can get them saved. But when that, when that, when that process of of, of discipleship begins to kick in, especially when we start talking about some of the things that is involved in discipleship, when that process kicks in, that's where the people then, they begin to, to drop away or pull away, and they begin to, they're, 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 there's a problem, and we'll explain where there's a problem, okay? We'll explain that to you in just a minute. But, but th th that's where the issue starts coming in in regard to discipleship, but so here, here's, here's the deal. I, I, I would assume that everybody who come to church on a Sunday night has got to be saved. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure you didn't have anything else better to do or something like that. So I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're saved here tonight. At this very moment, you are in some stage, some element, some process of discipleship. I like what Paul said, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform that work. And discipleship is a good work. So listen, listen to me now. Some of the things that you may be going through right now, some of the things that you may be experiencing, some of the questions that you may be having about your relationship to God, it may simply be that God is doing something in regard to you, in which he is, he is discipling you so that you can be more fruitful for him. We've heard Pastor talk about John chapter 15 a few, uh, well, been a few months ago now, and, and he talked about fruitfulness in regard to that. So uh, there, there it is. So 
the process of discipleship. There is, uh, there is basically 10 things that we'll be looking at. Now, we will not be looking at them in any particular order, but just let me give them to you, and they're listed for you right there on your handout that I've given to you. First of all, there is the idea of cleansing in chapter 13. Chapter 15, there is the idea of purging. Chapter 17, there is the idea of sanctifying. Notice the order that they occur. Cleansing, purging, sanctifying. That's significant. We'll talk about that. And then Jesus will talk about his departure, but he will also talk about his return. He will talk about his return literally in the future, but he also talk about his return spiritually to them almost immediately. Oh, my. There's the word hatred right there. You mean that is involved in discipleship? Yes. There's some hatred that goes on there. And uh, just, just so nobody don't get too upset, we're talking about it's not hatred between each other. It's hatred of the world for us. But we'll talk about that and, and, uh, and the place that, that that has in regard to us right there. If you look at the next page, page two, praise God. There's the Holy Ghost. Oh, my goodness alive. I mean, yes, there is the hatred of the world, and yes, there's some of these other things that are going on, but there is the promise of the Holy Ghost. And then there is the Word. And that idea is found in chapters 15 and 17. And then there is love, chapter 13 and, and 15 and 17. And then there is unity. All of this leads to Unity. Praise God. Jesus will talk about that in chapter 17. And then finally, there is the idea of witness. Jesus, in chapter 17, Jesus talks about our witness in regard to this world. Now again, all of this is intermingled. As I said, this is where the rubber meets the road. If it was easy, everybody would do it. This is where you separate the men from the boys. But this is what is involved in regard to discipleship. Let's look at Roman number two. Let's look at chapter 13. This idea of cleansing. <clears throat> cleansing is what we say is the initial stage in the process. <clears throat> now, here's you need to get this. This chapter points out the tension and the struggle that comes with discipleship training. I said it just a moment ago a couple of times. We need to understand that in this process of discipleship training, there's going to be some tension. There's going to be some resistance. There's going to be some questions. There's going to be a struggle in which you and I go through, okay? But the first thing that I want you to notice is found in John chapter 13, verse 1, okay? Notice what it says. Now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Listen. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That, that verse tells us a couple of things right there. First of all, it tells us that it was now time for Jesus to depart out of this world. The second thing that it tells us is there is the idea of love. John is telling us that everything that he is going to say from this point on, every statement that Jesus is going to make, in fact, everything that Jesus is going to do is going to be based upon the idea of love. You and I need to understand that. The whole context of chapter 13 through 17 starts out by letting us know that we are loved by the Lord. Now, here's the deal. 
When we get into these things in which there is tension, in which there may be strife, in which there may be questions, in which there may be a lot of other things, you and I need to understand that everything is happening to us. It is happening to us because Jesus, because God loves us. Everything that is done, every teaching that is given is based upon the fact that we are loved. He does not do these things. He does not allow these things to happen because he does not love you. He does love you. He does love me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves us. Mark that down. Get that in your mind. Understand it. Don't reject it. If you reject it, the devil will have a heyday with you. But you've got to understand tonight that wherever you are in this process, you are there because God loves you. He wants you to be everything that you can be. It tells us that right up front at the very start. He, he leaves no questions about it. It is about love. But then look at verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Wow. You talk about a contrast. You, you talk about going from one extreme to the other. In verse 1, we are told that we are loved. In verse 2, we are told that at that meeting, with Jesus and his 12 disciples, Pastor, you was talking about the devil being in the church this morning. We're, we're, we're said that at that meeting, the devil was there. That's not a good sign. We're also told that Judas was there, and we know what Judas did. That's not a good sign. We're also told about betrayal. Three words in that next verse of Scripture are all negative. The devil, Judas, and betrayal. Out of that love, that God has for us. You gotta understand something that you're gonna have to deal with the devil still. You gotta understand that you're gonna have you're gonna deal with betrayal. You're, you're gonna come up to those times in your life in which you're wondering, do I want to remain faithful to God or not? Or am I going to betray him? That's exactly what happened to Judas. And the reason that it happened to Judas is because the devil was there. A little bit later on it says, and the devil entered into Judas. In that very setting of the Last Supper, being in the presence of Jesus. And supper was over. Okay. In the context of love and service, there is verse 2. In the context of a shared meal, which is found in verses 21 through 30, I will not take time to read that. There is the devil, and there is Judas, and there is betrayal. In fact, since I've talked about that, let, let me, I do want to look at, at chapter 13, verses 21 and 27. Let, let me just read that to you to kind of let you know. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. See, he's loving them, but he's still troubled in spirit himself. And testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. He loved them. He loved Judas. But he said, one of you is going to betray me. And it, it, the number was limited. It wasn't a whole thousands out there. It was him and 12 men. Okay. In verse 27, and after the sop, what I said just a moment ago, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest do quickly. And of course, that's exactly what he did. So, in the context of a shared meal, in the context of love, there, there, is, there is the devil. And there is Judas, and there is betrayal. And it would be nice, oh, it'd be so wonderful 
I got saved when I was nine years old. It, it, it would be, it would have been, it been so wonderful if from that point on I was on a superficial joy ride, or not a superficial, a real joy ride, and just floating to heaven on a cloud, and just and just picking uh, daisies along the way. I don't know whatever flower you would pick, you know, and just 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 having a good high old time. But I'm telling you. Since I was, before I was nine years old, but really after I become a Christian at nine years old, my goodness alive, I, you know, I'm like you. I fought the world, the flesh, and the devil many, many times. And that's the way that it is, as God is, God is working on me for me to be what I am supposed to be. So, so in chapters 1 through 12, it is Jesus trying to get people to understand who he is. In chapters 13 through 17, it is Jesus trying to help the disciples understand who they are. Okay? Uh, what's going on in regard, to, in regard to them? In fact, if I can just diverge just a little bit, if you would please turn in your Bibles Back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. I, 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 I want to, to kind of chase a rabbit here for just a second. And, and I want you, I think we can begin to see by looking at this, what we really are, who we really are. And, uh, and this, is, this, is, this is John the Baptist. Now, if there's anybody who should have had an ego problem, it was John the Baptist. I mean, this man was called, feel what the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it, it, it just, 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 just tremendous. And had the call of God and, 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 and had, he owed nobody anything. He lived the life of a, of a person who was, I don't see one worldly component in John's life, John the Baptist's life, nothing. If anybody had a right to have an ego about who they were, it was John the Baptist. But listen, listen, listen to this. Look, look at what it says. John chapter 1, verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? Listen to what happens right here. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed I am not the Christ. I, I, I've got to write that. That's his first statement. Who are you? He says, I am not the Christ. They're wondering if he was Christ. He tells them right up front, I am not the Christ. Look at the next thing. That's what it says. And they ask him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Notice what he's done. First line, I am not the Christ. Second answer, I am not. No. Do you see what he's done? His first answer, he talks about himself with five words. His second answer, he talks about himself in three words. His final answer, he talks about himself in one word. It's a monosyllable and it's a negative. It is the word no. In other words, John is saying, you want to know who I am? I am nothing but a servant. Praise God. 
So when it comes to this issue of, of, uh, of, of Jesus, people understanding who Jesus is and us understanding who we are, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to put anybody down, okay? That's not what I'm trying to do right here. Please forgive me if you're taking it that way. That's not the way it's intended. But, but, but what we see right here in this idea of identity right here, John is reducing himself. What did John say? I must decrease in order that he may increase. Folks, we've got to decrease in order that he may increase. We've got to allow him to work in our lives to be the disciples that he wants us to be. And, we, and it's about service because he's going to teach them in just a few minutes about service when he will take off his garments, lay aside his garments, and, and get a towel and gird himself and begin to wash the disciples' feet. As far as I know, I stand to be corrected. Judas was one of them. He's showing them. He's showing us what discipleship is all about. I love what my friend Dan Carter told me one time. I've never forgotten. You may have heard it as well. I am a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. When we boil it down, that's what it's all about about if we can reduce ourselves to a monosyllable and it's a negative of no and let him be Lord and trust in him and depend upon him and allow him to work in our lives praise God then he can use us the problem is like I said there is the divine initiative and there is the human cooperation. God will do his part, but it seems like sometimes I don't want to cooperate. I, I'm, 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 just, I'm, just, I'm just not wanting to cooperate, you know. I, I'm, I'm just not there yet. And so he, he, he works with me, and, and he helps all of us to, to, to be where we ought to be. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Let's, 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 let's move on. Pastor Pastor said, how far would you get? I said, well, I'm sure I won't get over pages, page four. That's the reason you got four, four copies. I'm on page two, but, but, we're, but we're moving just a little bit. <clears throat> this idea of identity is more clearly found for us in verses three through five. Okay? <clears throat> despite all of this, despite everything that's happening in verse two, now, now you're saying, my goodness alive, if he takes that long to get through two verses of Scripture, we'll be here till 2023. No, we're, we're not, it's not going to be that quite that bad, okay? It's, uh, we, we will not, but these first few verses of Scripture, we really, really, really got to get to them. I, I wouldn't mind being here till 2023, but I would not do that to you. I, 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 uh, I love you too much. Uh, I want to continue to come to church here, and uh, I want you to let me come. Say amen. So praise the Lord. So note verses 3 through 5. They're in chapter, chapter 13. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Oh, I love that scripture. Think about it for just a minute. Jesus knows exactly what God has given to him. Jesus knows where he's from. And Jesus knows where he's going. Praise God. If we can be there, we'll be okay. What has God given to you? What, what do you have that God has given to you that he wants to use in your life? Second of all, where are you from? I'm not talking about a geographical location. I'm from Alcoa, Tennessee. Proud of it. But that's not where I'm from. I, I, I'm from a life in the past. Uh, again, nine-year-old boy, I didn't have a whole lot of time to accumulate a great deal of sins, but I was, I, was, I was a sinner and I knew I needed to be saved. That's where I'm from. 
But that's where the Lord, that's where the Lord, he found me where I was from. He accepted me where I was from. I'm from Alcoa, Tennessee, but I'm also a sinner. And, and that's where I'm from. And he accepted me in regard to that. And I know where I'm going. Praise God. After this service, good Lord willing, I'm going home. But that's not, that's not, that's geographical. I'm going, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, we'll get to that a little bit later, but let me share it right now. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be. We're going to go where he's gone. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's where I'm going. So I've got, I've got that all settled. Praise God. That's, 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 that's pretty good. But then, when you know where you're from, you know where you're going, and you know what God's given to you, look, look what he does when he understands those things. When he understands those things, this is what he does. Verse 4, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Jesus knew three things. Again, what God had given him, where he was from, and where he was, where he was going. Verses 4 and 5, understanding that, he laid aside his garments. As far as I know, this was the only possession that he had. I'm on page three. I made it to page three. He laid aside his garments. I, I, when I think about that, I've got the scripture there. Philippians chapter two, verses six through eight. Let me turn there and read that, read that for you. Philippians chapter two. You, you know what I'm talking about. You know that scripture. You're familiar with it. Okay, Philippians chapter two, Verses 6 through 8. Amen. It's in the New Testament. Amen. It says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Yes. He laid aside his deity and came to this earth. And now he is laying aside his garments. Okay? The only possession that he has. Again, later, these, these garments would be taken and given to executioners and gambled over, and there's the scripture reference. We won't take time to read that, but that's exactly what he did. And Jesus, in doing this all along, he's going to tell them just a little bit later on, I've given you an example. If I, your Lord and Master, have done this for you, you ought to do it one for another. He said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ was, was the Lord of glory, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords was willing to lay aside his, his glory, his splendor, okay? He was willing to lay those things aside and come and, 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 and take on a form just like you and me. And, and, and become obedient unto the death of the cross. You and I, this is what he wants. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is one of the main things in regard to discipleship. But there are a lot of things. But, but, but what he's teaching us right here is that there's some times that we may need to lay some things aside. Yeah. And say, that's not important. If that is going to hinder me in my service for the kingdom, I'm going to lay it aside. I'm going to put it aside. It's not going to dominate me. We lay it aside. and We become obedient. We become obedient 
to cruciformity, what I call. The idea of cruciformity, in my opinion, has two connotations right there. Number one, yes, there is the possibility, the very real possibility. I, and I think we're seeing it more and more clear, even in this nation in which we live, that there may, came a, there may come a time in which you and I will have to make a life and death decision in regard to Jesus Christ. Yes. And we need to understand that. But not only that, today, you and I are making a life and death decision in regard to Jesus Christ from the perspective that Jesus says. He says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself and you've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow after me. I know that's not popular. I know we don't want to think in those terms, but this is what Jesus is saying. You've got to lay aside some things right here and you've got to be willing to, to, to take up your cross. I like what Paul said in regard to the cross. He said, by the cross, I am crucified to the world and the world is crucified unto me. Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. A double crucifixion right there. And if we have that double crucifixion operating within our life, then, then, then there's no way that the world can really affect us. And, and we've got to live that. We've got to understand that in regard to the things of God. Well, it's about 7 o'clock, and I want to respect your time. I appreciate you coming here tonight, and this is probably a pretty good stopping place. Uh, we will pick up on page 3 right there with Peter. Some interesting things happen in regard to Peter right there. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Pastor, do you want the service back, or do I just? Okay, all right. Would you stand together with us, please? Father, I come unto you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings unto us. Lord, I, I thank you that you came and you, you laid aside everything and you, you, you became a man and, and you lived just like you, just, you went through everything that we go through, but you did it success, successfully. Because you are that master, you can teach us. And we'll listen to your teaching. Lord, may, it may hurt sometimes. It, it, it may bother us sometimes, but Lord, because of who you are and what you did, help us to submit ourselves to that which you want to do in our lives. Be with each and every person this week, throughout this week. I pray, Lord, that your grace and mercy and love and hope and peace and joy would be multiplied unto them as they go through this process of discipleship. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen and amen.